When we look at databases, we typically will, um, as we look at microservices rather, we can kind of look at it like this. We started out with a spaghetti architecture. We moved to a lasagna architecture, an end tier architecture. And now we're in the ravioli stage of microservices. Now, why did we do this? Well, when we had a monolith, all of the things were packaged together. And they were all packaged together so that we could deploy it easily because, well, deployment was hard. Containers have solved this, and now we can deploy really easily with containers. So we end up with lots of little pieces that can be deployed and upgraded and replaced really easily. As we moved from monoliths to microservices, we did great at being able to get our uh, functionality into small pieces. One of the core tenets of a microservice is that it owns its own data. So, well, here's the data store associated with that microservice. Here's another data store associated with that microservice. Each microservice owns its own data. It does one small job. It's easy to deploy. It, we can scale independent of other content. It's easy to replace. And in particular, <laughs> it owns its own data. But usually when we start talking about microservices and in particular databases, we end up with this. We've refactored our application into lots of microservices, but we still have one big monolithic database. Uh, <laughs> I've been the person who architects this way, but uh, yeah, why do we do that? Well, probably the most frequent reason that we cite is because the DBA said no. Why did the DBA say no? Well, unlike microservices, the way we deploy a database, the way we migrate a database is very different. Users get a little bit distraught when we just pave over everything and replace it with a new copy like we do with microservices. So, well, as an app developer and a database developer, our jobs is to provide value to users. So we're really on the same side of this. Why else would, a, would we end up with a monolithic database? Well, because provisioning databases is hard. It's much, diff, much more difficult to get a database in place together with the engine, the data, um, secure, security details, authentication, and backup, all of those take, well, they take some care. If we end up with lots of little databases, then we need to make sure that each of those are backed up and um, authenticated. I've been on that project where a small database went down and we're like, oh, well, we'll just pull that, uh, pull the database from a recent copy of the backup, right? We backed it up, right? Right? <laughs> that was a bad day. So we ended up with a monolithic database. Well, if we have a monolithic database, we can pretend that it's lots of little databases with bounded context. A bounded context in an application is that portion of the database that applies to this specific domain. Let's look, for example, at a shopping cart and a fulfillment. Both of them deal with products. But a shopping cart's job is to show all the pictures, the descriptions. It's a read-only view of the product catalog. By comparison, the fulfillment center needs only know what is the product ID and the quantity on hand. It doesn't need access to the pictures and description, maybe not even the product name. We can build two different bounded contexts around the product details and be able to expose them as micro as bounded contacts into our microservices. Perfect. Well, when we can get to that point where we have enough automation to be able to enroll our databases automatically in authentication strategies and also enroll them automatically in backup strategies, we can get to, I'll coin the term, micro databases. A micro database is that database that is owned by a microservice. Now, if a microservice is going to own its own data, then it may have one or more micro databases, or it may have no micro databases. In this case, this microservice here doesn't do anything that requires storing state, so it doesn't have a micro database at all. But these services each have their micro databases. Perfect. Now, a micro database, it's owned by one microservice. Other services call this microservice to get data, to get or change data. So now we may run into a few different problems here. How do we do a join? Do I really need to call that other microservice for each record in the result set to be able to get the additional data? 
Instead, let's create an event store. Now this event store stores all of the events that happen in our system. And at each stage, we can publish events that respond to the different items in our, in our task. Then one or more, or maybe no services, listen to those events and are able to forward those on and take additional actions. Our reporting service, the one that needs to do the joins, can listen to all these events, those that it care about, and create its denormalized view of the data. So when it comes time to build that report, we don't need to join on a different micro database. We already have the data that we need. Another concern when we move here is, how do we store the customer record? Now this customer record is owned by a lot of different places and they'll each have additional metadata associated with this customer. How about a shopping cart? They're the ones that are producing orders. Maybe they should own the customer record. Or billing, they probably have credit card numbers stored and we definitely don't want those leaking out of the microservice. Human resources is known for having lots of secrets. Maybe they should own the customer record. Or sales, they're the ones who created the customer in the first place. Well, how about if we create a new customer microservice and a new customer micro database that has two columns, one with the account number, the second with the primary key, and that's all. All of the rest of these services can call that customer microservice if they want to create a new customer or if they want to resolve a primary key into an account number or vice versa. All of the other details can be stored in their associated microservices. The shopping cart can store the orders or the last known address, all of the customer details in their own customer profile table. Same thing with billing. The credit card numbers can end up in the customer profile and that billing customer profile is different from the shopping cart customer profile. In particular, sales. When sales creates a new lead, it may just be the first name and last name and phone number. It may not even be a company name. And so that can store can be stored in the sales details. When they're ready to convert that lead into a customer, they can call the customer microservice to get the next primary key, creating that account number. Perfect. We've got that customer record in place. So now that we've gotten to micro databases, we know that each microservice owns its own data. Now we don't need to go wandering around the office. Are you using this column? Are you? Can we remove it? Can we split it? A microservice owns its own data. That micro database is exclusively owned by that service. And if the service no longer needs it, then that micro database is obsolete and can be removed. Perfect. What's really interesting is each of these micro databases can be optimized for the task at hand. They don't all need to be the same type of database. Uh, said by me right now. <laughs> I like this quote. Okay, so let's take a look at the different database types that we have. Well, there's a lot to choose from. Let's take a look at each of these. Relational, document, graph, key value. And we'll look at some of the other types. You may not have heard of some of these. And in particular, let's look at hybrid and multi-model databases as well. As we look at each database type, we'll look at the characteristics, pros and cons, and when it is best to use this micro, this database type. First, let's take a, take a look at a relational database or a SQL database. We can think of this like an Excel table. The beautiful thing is that in each table, we have rows and columns. Each row represents one item of data and each column represents data that is specific to that type. In my address, column, I will have addresses. In my phone number column, I'll have phone numbers. So we create a relational database where we can have these tables that start to relate to each other. What's particularly cool is the SQL query language is really optimized for efficiently processing these queries. Next, we have ACID compliance. Let's double click into that. ACID compliance, atomic. It all succeeds or fails, consistent, no partial transactions, isolated, transactions don't overlap, and durable. Once it's done, it's done. With ACID compliance, we know that the entire set will either succeed or fail together. We won't get a partial transaction. We won't get half the data. By comparison, we could look at eventual consistency. In eventual consistency, it'll all finish eventually. But if we write and then immediately read, we may not get the right answer. For example, if I walk into Starbucks and I start purchasing a thing, and then I immediately check my statement, 
I probably won't see that charge. But by the end of the month, my credit card statement is gonna show all of the trips to Starbucks. It is eventually consistent. So here in SQL, we have ACID compliance. We know that as soon as we finish writing, we can read and we're good to go. On the upside, Relational databases have a strong schema, table joins, a very optimized engine, and compatible familiar syntax. On the downside, it was built in an era where we didn't have multiple processors working together. So generally, a relational database is one big machine. We can vertically scale easily, but horizontally scaling is hard. Here's some example relational databases. Relational database is a good default. I bet if you have a monolithic database, it is a relational database. Next up, let's look at NoSQL. Now I'm gonna specifically call this document databases because well, everything that isn't SQL is technically NoSQL. So in a document database, we're storing JSON. Now this JSON doesn't need to have the same schema for each document and we can have nested fields. Our data may already look like this. So a, data, a document database may be a good fit. On the upside, we can nest documents however we'd like. We have no schema. On the downside, our application may assume a particular schema, which means we need to do extra error handling in case a field doesn't exist. And how do we query into an array if the array doesn't exist? These are questions that our application needs to solve, and it may make our application more difficult. On the upside, we have a denormalized schema that um, a denormalized system, and so we may have uh, we may be able to scale horizontally really easily. On the downside, we have no transactions or joins, things that we're used to in a SQL-based system. Next, here's some examples of some uh, document databases. Document databases are great when I need to read the entire thing straight away. Perhaps a product catalog or a news site or a CMS. Given that page slug, I need to go grab the entire document including the title, the author, the story, the images, maybe the first page of comments. All of that will get stored in that one document so that I can read it really quickly. Document databases are usually optimized for reads. Next up, let's look at graph databases. With a graph database, we have not only nodes, but we also have relationships between nodes. We have a really elegant syntax for being able to query through these graph databases and navigate these relationships. I can store data not only on the nodes, but also on the relationships. So how is this different from a SQL table with two foreign keys? Well, it's about that query syntax, being able to navigate those joins really easily. By comparison, if I had a table with lots of joins, I would need to repeat that join a whole lot of times to be able to get the friends and friends of friends. A graph database is great for being able to navigate those relationships, but it's really tuned for that experience. So it's not really great at other things. So for example, cross table joins are not really very performant in a graph database. Graph databases are best used for messaging apps or social networks, a recommendation engine, something where I need to be able to navigate between these relationships. Here's some examples. Next up, a key value database. The beauty of a key value database is that we basically have one primary key column and one blob that is, well, whatever kind of data that we need. The blobs don't need to be the same format or even the same length. They just get put in place, we read by key, and we're able to get that data. So it's really fast if we do queries by ID. I could use this for caching to be able to store a user's session or a shopping cart. On the downside, I can't really filter by any other column because the data may be different types, Basically, the only way to filter by a non-key ID is to iterate through all of the columns, deserializing each in the way that it should be read, and then filtering the data there. Here's some examples of key value columns. It's great for cache, for configuration, for user data. What makes it great for configuration is that the values don't all need to be the same. One might be a string, one a number, one an array of content, and a key value database does just fine with that. Next up, let's look at time series databases. In a time series database, we are able to select content for, uh, and rather than just rows and columns with each cell holding one value, each cell holds a range of values, all the things that fit within this time bucket. It's great for fast ingest of real-time events. 
So with the time series database, I'm able to query events. And inside that time bucket, I can do aggregate functions like min, max, count. I can start to average or normalize for missing data. On the downside, it's not really tuned for anything else. Here's some examples of time series databases. It's great when I'm trying to monitor mobile devices, sensors, stock trades, something that is very time centric. I can pull the time in really quickly, and I can be able to bucket on this time to be able to build, for example, candlestick charts. Next up, let's look at text search databases. Text search databases are great for being able to identify a particular phrase in a document or to identify which documents match this phrase. It's often paired with a natural language processing system, and then we end up with a search engine. It uses an inverted index, much like the index at the back of a book. We'll go grab all of the words in this document, we'll stick them in that inverted index, and we'll be able to look through that index to find the documents that have this phrase. On the upside, it's optimized for text and being able to find either documents that match or the pages, the content inside the document that matches. On the downside, it's really not geared, geared for anything else. So if I have any metadata associated with that document, I'll probably store that elsewhere filter on that other data store for those documents that have the right metadata, and then use my text search database to find the matching documents. There are no relationships. One of the other things inside of a text search database is stop words. In English, a, an, the, these words have no meaning on their own. And so, well, we probably exclude them from our index just for size. <coughs> In the, um, in another language or culture, the stop words may be different. So it's easy to accidentally get stop words that are incorrect. Here's some examples of text search databases. It's great for finding matching documents and finding the content within a document. Next, object stores. S3 is a great example of this. We have a key that is a path, and let's pretend that it's you know files and folders but really it's just a key. We'll probably delimit it by slashes to pretend that it's a file system. And then the value is one big binary blob. So I might store things like database backups or uh, movies or images. Now the beautiful thing here is that I can now query those by ID and render these big things in really elegant ways. On the downside, I can't filter by anything else. Much like a key value store, if I want to filter by when is the last time this document was updated, I probably need to grab each database backup in time, unzip it or untar it, deserialize it in the way that makes sense, and go look for the file within that backup. I might want to have a, an additional data store, maybe a relational data store that stores that metadata associated with each file. Object stores, here's some examples. It's best for big things where I only need to grab it by key. Next, event sourcing. With an event sourcing system, I will publish events into one side and then consume it in another side. It's great for a publish subscribe system when I want to communicate between systems asynchronously. They don't both need to be online. And whenever that system comes back online, it can continue reading from wherever it was. That's perfect. Further, I can filter this feed based on channels or topics and subscribe to only the events that I need to. In effect, different consumers can read at different portion, at different parts, and whenever they get caught up, they're able to read that content. What's really elegant is if I change my business rules, I can reset a consumer to be able to restart reading at the beginning and get caught up to whatever the new business rules are. It's pub sub, but it's asynchronous. I can publish as fast as I can and consume it whenever I'm ready. On the upside, it's great for being able to stream these events to anyone who needs to know it. On the downside, getting the current version is much more difficult. I must start at the beginning and rebuild the entire history to be able to get at the result. But on the upside, if I change my business rules, I can replay that experience to find a new answer. Event sourcing, here's some examples of event stores, data stores. It's best used to transmit systems asynchronously when hardware failure may be an issue here. Next up, column stores. Now, this is an adaptation of a relational model where data is stored in columns instead of rows. 
On the left, we have a traditional relational database where we have data stored in rows. On the right, we have column stores. Let's imagine countries in the world or states in the country. We probably have a very limited set. So we can compress this data really quickly, which means we can load a lot of data really fast. Column stores are great for analytical workloads where we can read bulk read content, uh, bulk seek, and then bulk read content, as opposed to transactional workloads, which would be best for a different data store. Column stores are not great at transactional processing. Here's some examples of column stores. Column stores are great for analytical workloads where I want to process data in bulk. Hybrid databases. We've looked at a lot of different types of data stores, and we've seen pros and cons in each section. Well, what if I want something that can do lots of things? What if I have a relational database, but I also have a JSON column that allows me to do document data processing as well? What if I have a time series windowing function inside my SQL database? Hybrid databases are kind of really elegant, and they start to expand our views beyond just the type that we're looking for. Here's the spot where you should take a screenshot, grab your camera. Here's each of the data stores, a description of it, and what it's best used for. Next, let's take a look at some of the things that we learned today. We start, started our journey from monolithic database to micro databases. We saw how in a monolithic database, we could use a bounded context to be able to get a, a micro database-like experience in spite of the fact that we only had one big database. Once we had enough automation to be able to automatically subscribe our database into authentication and backup schemes, we can move to micro databases. And then at that point, each of the micro databases might be whatever type is best suited for its need. The different data stores that we looked at are here. Now, what are my best practices? Well, ideally you should use a database as a service. Let somebody else worry about um, uptime and point in time restore and ensuring that all of that content is ready. If you must, then you can use it on premise, but ideally database as a service is best. If you have more than one database server, you should use automation to ensure that your database is enrolled in authentication and backup schemes to ensure that you don't miss one. Choose a SQL database by default because that's a pretty good standard. Uh, SQL databases have a really fast query engine, and we have ACID compliance, which may be a feature that you really need. If you find an exact match in another type of database, then reach out for that database that is exactly suited for your need. Is it a blob store? Is it a full text search engine? When you move towards micro databases, you can grab the data store that is exactly tuned to your need. And if you need some features of this and some features of that, you may choose to have multiple micro databases or reach for a hybrid database that can do multiple things. This has been a lot of fun getting to share with you databases in the microservices world. If you're watching this later, hit me up on Twitter at Rob underscore Rich. The slides are online right now at robrich.org.